Payless growing up. Like I wasn't like I really knew anything wow. about fashion. I um, wanted to figure out a way to be in magazines. And I loved putting all the different magazines on the wall. And I remember it was a really big deal. My mom let me paint my wall all these different colors and put up scrappings and we had a lot of conversations about creative things. Um, I'm really close to my family, so I, I talk, to, talk about them a lot. And I spent a lot of time with my grandmother growing up just making quilts and rugs and pillows. And so it was just, I liked being creative, but it honestly wasn't until college that uh, one of my professors actually took me aside and said, you know, I think maybe you want to try it at magazine. You really like to read. Um, you really like to write, like you want to be creative, maybe this is the outlet for you. And so she had actually sent me a listing um, for a Teen Vogue internship that was literally just schlepping, cleaning the closet, the fashion closet, wow. nothing glamorous. Um, and I remember telling her, I was like, they're not going to accept me. Like this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, this is when like The Hills was on TV and there was a lot of reality television around working in fashion. Um, but they said yes. And I was, I was really hooked and excited. And so I did a ton of different internships um, to try to figure it out. I did, you know, I tried celebrity styling, styling in LA, realized I don't want to work for a celebrity. Um, I did a lot of, um, you know, design classes and, and realized I don't really want to work at a design house and I really want to work, you know, an editorial. And so um, I just hustled a ton and moved out here to New York after I graduated from college and emailed everyone furiously and ended up getting an entry level job at Teen Vogue out of school. Wow. Is there, I mean, there, there's, as you say, like the hills and, and, and there's a kind of a mythology about what it means to be in the, in the, in the, in the publishing world, especially in the fashion publishing world. And obviously, Devil Wars Prada, everybody knows that, that, that film and book. Is there is there any truth to that? Is it cutthroat? Is it quite as cutthroat? Incredibly, incredibly yes. But more, I, it didn't, I think occur to me, I, the, the cutthroatness, yes, made sense, but I didn't realize, I think, the layers before I got into the industry. And I think a lot of times I thought it would be more microaggressions as far as racism, but then it was a lot more overt racism, but also classism, elitism, nepotism. Um, and it, it hit me really hard when I started working in fashion officially when I left school because I just felt incredibly lost. And I think also just coming from the Midwest, you, you do have a certain uh, naive presence about you and just expecting a niceness and kindness out of people. And um, I really felt those for a very long time, but especially those first couple of years that I just wasn't going to cut it because I was black and I wasn't rich and I was always working three jobs. And so I wasn't able to afford like, you know, the luxury designer to wear to work. And I always had to work, you know, go somewhere after the job. So I was always rushing of after the job, I would maybe go to another shoot and I, or I would, you know, change mannequins, the DKNY store weekends. I was always waitressing. Um, and I just felt like it, was very much the odds were against me, but I felt like I had something to offer. And so a lot of those first couple of years was spent really trying to figure out, should I stay or should I go back to Wisconsin? And you've written a lot about this over, over the course of your career, um, including a really famous piece that you, you won awards for. But I, I want to ask you, what, um, what was it that, that gave you the, the strength or the, the, feeling that you wanted to stick it out and stay and, and eat despite all of those things that you, that you saw and experienced? I think a lot of it was thinking about my family and the sacrifices that they made for me. Um, my parents just worked so hard to, to send my sister and I to, you know, good schools and, and be so involved in our lives. And, um, I was close with both of my grandmothers, one of whom passed last year. And I don't, I just spent a lot of time thinking about these people have done so much for me and given so much for me. And I don't have the right to give up yet. Like I haven't earned the right to be lazy. I haven't earned the right to give up. These people have given their lives and sacrificed so much for me to even try to do this. And I think just the realization of, you know, the the things that they had to do, even when I think about my grandmothers, they both were really into fashion and, and wore Sunday best and always really dressed up and, you know, the most beautiful hats and gloves and most amazing outfits um, with so little money. But, you know, their day jobs were, you know, 
just regular jobs. My my grandmother in Wisconsin, she worked at a steel factory. Um, my grandmother down south, she worked at a cotton mill. And I just think about that because I think for me, it was like, you know, they had to do all those things to make ends meet. And so I don't really feel like I earn the right to just say, I'm tired of this and I want to give up. And, and I always think of them. Lindsay, you started your position um, as editor-in-chief at The Cut in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, and I think it's, it's, it's worth pointing out that it's not just being the editor-in-chief, it's being the manager, being the leader of, of, a, of a team of people. Um, and that is in, incredibly complex to do in a normal time when you're walking into an office and you're the new face and then you're the leader. But to do that remotely, I can't even imagine how, how complex it is. Walk, walk me through the first, your first kind of weeks at, at the cut and, 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 and basically starting this job remotely. <laughs> yeah, I actually didn't have a break from leaving Teen Vogue to the cut. I ended Teen Vogue on a Friday, Monday I started at the cut. And so um, it definitely was a, a switch in my mind of like, okay, now we have to switch gears here. Um, I mean, I, I think for me, it is always about empathy. Um, this past year has just been insane for everyone on so many levels. Um, myself, I, I lost six family members to COVID. And so I felt like, God, I don't even, you know, some days I just didn't want to work. Some days I just felt like, you know, I wish I could be around my family. This is the longest time I've gone without seeing my family. And I think remembering that and also just having so many conversations with people one-on-one -on -one was really important to me because, everybody's headspace in a different place and I don't want to assume anything. And I think for me, it's also just really important to never think too highly of myself. Um, all these accolades and things are, are wonderful and I'm all, I'm super appreciative, but it's always going to be about the hustle for me and I don't ever want to take that for granted. And so for me, it's, it's never coming in and being like, well, I'm important and <laughs> let's hear the sound of my voice. No, um, I want to hear from everyone. And so I've just taken a lot of time to have one-on-ones with everybody and hear how they're doing, how they're feeling, what they need from me, um, what, you know, what they're needing as far as their growth um, in their career and their path. And I think just taking that time to let people, I think, explain where they're at instead of me bulldozing my opinion is is the way that I really like to manage. I think this has probably been one of the hardest years also um, to, to be a manager, to manage people um, because of the isolation of the pandemic and, and all of the the things that that entails. Um, and, I, and, you know, there people probably have an impression of an editor-in-chief as somebody who gets to do all these fun, creative things only <laughs> and, and look at the you know, the finished magazine and, and, you know, um, and, and make changes, but that's only part of the job. A, a big part of the job is managing people in an organization. Um, how have you, how have you kind of learned how to do that or, or how are you learning how to do that? Cause it's so hard. I mean, it's hard for anybody and I can't even imagine doing it remotely. Yeah. I mean, I'll never forget when I left Teen Vogue, um, a couple of the staffers had said to me that they just appreciated how much of a human approach I was as a manager. And I thought that was probably one of the nicest things that anyone had said to me, because I think a lot of times it can feel in the past for me being managed by a lot of different people. It felt like the manager was just separate and I'm above you and I talk down to you and I'm leading this and you're the team. And I really have tried to make sure that I am having that human approach that I'm not separate. If if you feel like we're losing and we're not doing something, then that then that means I'm losing and we're not doing something. And I think just leveling that equal playing field is really important. But I think also just having those conversations that you probably wouldn't have all the time or wouldn't have had before this past year. And I think just having that transparency is really, really important for me because I think as a writer, I always felt like people maybe weren't interested in, in investing in me enough or maybe communicating things to me enough. And I always want to, I think the transparency point is so key because I never want people to feel like they have to guess what they're getting with me and understand really how I feel about their work or where they're going or what I need from them. And so I think the transparency piece is also incredibly important. Um, I'm, by the way, if you're just joining us, uh, welcome. 
Uh, I'm talking with Lindsay Peoples Wagner, uh, editor in chief of the Cut. If you've got questions for Lindsay, um, please submit them uh, via Facebook or Instagram. Instagram, I don't think Instagram, uh, link, LinkedIn, Twitter, however you're watching, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Um, I, I read that you um, this past year you stopped making plans on the weekends. That that you're yeah. just feeling so burned out. I think a lot of people can relate to that. I can relate to that um, for sure. Um, so burned out. I'll be honest with you. I didn't even want to show up to my studio here this morning because I just, it was one of those mornings, you know, where I just felt burned out yes. <laughs> and I can't, I can't explain it. It's not, it's not connected to anything in particular, but I think, um, uh, and it's hard because, uh, you know, you know, p there are people who are have to go to uh, you know, to, to a factory every day and ha have to, and have no choice, right? There are things that people do and, and you start to think, well, why do I feel burned out? But, but I think a lot of us are kind of experiencing that silently. Um, how do you cope with burnout? How, how are you dealing with it? You know, it's an easy thing to say, but a hard thing to do. I have to turn everything off. Um, honestly, I mean, Technology and social media are great because you can connect with all these people and we're able to do things like this. But the less people can reach me, the better, because I just need to turn my brain off. Um, and I think especially in media, your brain is constantly on because even if you're like, let's say, watching a new TV show. For me, it's never just let me enjoy the show. It's like, oh, do we need to cover one of the people in this show? Do we need to write about it? Do we need to critique it? Did we miss this moment? Your mind just continues to go. And so even in the things that I do for my enjoyment time are usually things that are very separate from my job. So a lot of people who would, if they follow me on social media will know I really love to cook. Um, and that's enjoyable for me because I have to use both of my hands and I don't, you know, I'm not like checking Slack or, and I'm not on social media. Um, and I just need something that completely uses a different part of my brain to be able to relax. Um, and I think, I think over the years in, in going to therapy, I just realized that a lot of things that I was trying to do in my downtime, I was still really anxious and where I was still just on my phone the whole time if I was watching something or trying to do something else. And so um, my husband was the one who actually told me like, even hanging out with your friends, he was like, just do it during the week. So on the weekends, you can just be still. Um, and it's been really helpful <laughs> and, it, and it sounds strange because you're like, I mean, yeah, you wanna, maybe you wanna hang out with your friend on the weekend or something like that. And obviously I would make exceptions if somebody had a birthday or if I felt like it, but it was really nice to not make any commitments to anyone for yeah. two days. Yeah. And I, and I just needed that. I know not everybody has the, the privilege to do this. Um, and so I, I'm always very hesitant when I talk about it. But one of the things that I. Unite and only, you know, bringing it back on Saturday on Sunday mornings. And it's actually had a huge impact on my mental health. It's, it's having that one day of not engaging has been really important because I, I think you're right. We're, we are tethered to this thing, this device, and, um, and it's super addictive. And, and for many of us in media, um, there's so many inputs. There's so much information coming at us that we right. feel like we have to absorb. Yeah. It's too many things at once for sure. And it, I think, um, just having that time to, be still um, has been has been really nice. I mean, even uh, we had to move apartments last minute um, earlier this year, and the apartment that we moved to has a garden. And it was so nice because I remembered I was like, oh, I used to garden a ton with my mom growing up, and even just doing that and not being on my phone and not having to, I think you know, just catch up with other things and just being with nature was just such a nice break. Okay. 
Yeah, totally fine. Sorry about that. Oh, it's fine. Are we still are we still live there, John Isabella? Okay, great. All right. We're I'm back. I'm I'm hardwired in. I should be good. All right. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. This is the beauty of of the Zoom world is that uh, sometimes things things break down. Lindsay, I'm sorry you were right. We were talking about just that you know that idea of of, of putting things away, and you were in the middle of 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 your 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 experience and thoughts. Oh no, I was just saying that it's it often I think reminds me that there's just so many things that I can do to step away and my husband and I had to end up moving apartments earlier earlier this year and the place that we moved to has a backyard and so we were gardening this past weekend and it was so nice. I was like, oh my God, nature, look at this. Yeah. And you just forget, I mean, even just, you know, getting outside because you just have to be on so many Zooms of working from home um, and especially with my job of checking in with so many people. So it's been nice to also just start to get outside because I think that always helps. Even if you don't have a backyard, just getting outside to walk is, is really nice. So, yeah. Lindsay, I want to ask you about um, um, an, an initiative you launched, I think, last year. June um, called Black and Fashion, Black and Fashion Council. Um, tell me, tell me more about about it, about the organization. Yeah, um, when I did the original piece, uh, which you know was a few years ago, it, it felt like I think last year in having so many conversations with different POC in the industry that it was time to take it to the next level, and I think it really felt like all these narratives are out. We've told all these stories of like what is happening, what needs to change. And basically a lot of people in the industry have read this and, and then some. So what needs to shift in order for there to actually be a shift in the industry overall? Um, and just got on a lot of Zooms with my co-founder, Sandrine Charles. Uh, she's a, She has her own PR firm. And we decided to you know partner with the Human Rights Campaign on a corporate equity index and actually make um you know an industry-wide i think business plan as far as how do we make inclusivity holistically part of your business plan um i think specifically fashion and media everything that we do is so subjective as far as you know who we think is cool enough who we think is worthy who we think is on brand um and that's really hard to rate that's really hard to put against numbers and i think what we saw was a lot of these companies having the right policies that were really inclusive, but not actually putting the policies into practice or really doing the front facing things of MLK quote on Instagram or um, their runway or their cover was a POC, but then internally at the company, there isn't you know diversity internally at the company. They don't actually really care about POC and being promoted or senior level executives. And so it really is that holistic approach and a lot of the work that we're doing to, to make sure that, I mean, the goal is one day that DEI won't have to be a separate initiative for companies that everyone inherently cares and 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 that the bar i think is higher as far as what we accept um we're getting a bunch of questions in from um people watching i want to get to some of them um because they're a lot of them are, are are mentorship questions and and i mean what a great mentor you are um this is from nicole uh Calazzo Sanana, who is actually an NPR intern, Nicole asks, what advice do you have for young journalists who are graduating into this pandemic? Ooh, I mean, I know it seems bleak and I know it seems tough, but if you have a perspective and you have laser focus on what you're writing about, there's always room for that. I think finding your specific voice is really important because I think Twitter has made people want to write for Twitter and want to go viral, um, want want a piece to do really well on Twitter. And, and I want writers, especially young writers, to just understand that's not the end all be all. Just because a piece doesn't do well on Twitter doesn't mean it, it isn't good. And I think a lot of times 
people are writing in that vein. And I, and I want young writers especially to just understand that that validation only goes so far and, and what you really need is to hone in on your voice. Um, here's another question, um, and I, I'm, I'm, forgive me for my pronunciation, but I believe it's Mandib uh, Mpofu uh, via YouTube. Um, and Mandib asks, have you ever dealt with imposter syndrome being a young black woman in such an influential position? And if so, how do you navigate that? So I have an interesting answer to this question. <laughs> I'm prefacing with that. Um, honestly, I have long felt like I'm equipped to do what I need to do. And I never try to boast of how smart I am or whatever. I, nobody cares. And, and I'm not that kind of person. But I also just think, especially um, in the world, but also in fashion, there have been a lot of white people who have had jobs that they were not even equipped for that had the role. And so I don't ever feel that way because I feel like I am continuously and always going to be a hustler. I'm usually the most ambitious person in the room. So I've never felt like, oh, am I good enough? I feel like, honestly, there's always too much pressure on me to overperform in every single way. Um, and that I think that pressure has been interesting to, to try to, to figure my way through. I mean, you've, you've had such a successful career in publishing. What, what advice would you give some, to, to somebody who, who wanted to work at one of the magazines that you, you've been at? Like what, um, how, how should they sort of approach, approach their career? Yeah, I mean, my advice I always give people is to make sure that you are hungry to do the work and less thirsty for attention. I think a lot of people look at me and think, oh, you get to do all these cool things, but I, I will still do whatever it takes to get the work done. I am not the person that is like, well, let me go find someone to go do this because I'm the editor, so I'm not doing that. Nothing is beneath me, nothing. And I think when you're hungry to do the work, that's something that's inside of you that no matter what job you have, it doesn't matter. You're just excited to do the work. I'm excited to make great work. That's why I'm doing this job. And you know, the social media accolades, all of that I think is, is a nice additive, but it's it's not, you know, the reason why you should be doing it or your motivation behind it. Yeah. What, how would you sort of define how you have grown as a leader over the last year? Um, I mean, I can't imagine what, in some ways, like as difficult as this past year has been, it's also been like uh, probably a, for so many people I've interviewed, um, a kind of like a, like a rocket ship. Um, like an accelerant because it's forced them to interrogate themselves and their own approach and, and, you know, and, and to improve. Um, what, how do you think your style has changed or what you, how have you, what have you learned about the way you lead? I think, um, honestly, to slow down a bit, um, I, I, my mind runs <laughs> a million miles an hour and, I think especially last year with the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, there were just days that I, I, it's not normal for me to not know what to do. Um, and it's not normal for me to feel like I, I don't know what else I can do because I'm just so heartbroken in this moment. And I think that made me realize that I just needed to slow down and figure out, okay, like this is a moment that that as a black woman, I have to grieve, I have to understand, I have to be able to move through, but also use my platform, use, you know, what we're given to be able to make a difference and to be able to, I think, push culture forward and have really important conversations. Um, and I think usually I'd be like, okay, let's do this, let's do that, da da da. And it, it was a big learning experience for me to, you know, I have to, I have to feel these feelings as well. Um, even though I'm managing people, even though I'm running a site and that that's definitely been a, a learning curve for me. Um, what, I mean, in terms of, of, you know, we were talking about this a little bit before we went live, but, um, it seems to me that it's unlikely that that once the pandemic is, let's say, sort of over and, and we're not wearing masks, let's say, and we can interact in in close quarters again, um, it, it seems un unlikely to me that we're going to go back to 2019, 
You know, it just seems unlikely. It's possible. I, I think I'd be really surprised. What, what do you, how do you imagine, you know, the sort of the post pandemic work environment? How, how do you think that's going to kind of play out for, for, for you, for you, you and your team? I talk a lot about boundaries with the team, and I think um, healthy boundaries is is a great conversation to continuously have. Um, I mean, there is no such thing as perfect work life balance. I don't think that's ever happened for anyone. And I think even for myself, it was like I knew in starting this job, um, I was going to just have to kind of swing to, okay, I'm going to be working a lot later nights and I'm going to be working a lot harder than um, once I'm able to get in the swing of things with people and that's okay. And I think I kind of, I definitely had the past couple of years, this pressure of like trying to get it right in that balance, but it has been more of a harmonious rhythm of like, okay, a little bit there, a little bit there. Um, and just being okay with that as far as um, work schedule and then finding a better, I think, balance in it that's not so rigid and perfect. But um, I've definitely had a lot of conversations with people on just having those healthy boundaries. I feel like everyone, especially being at home, it's hard to, it's hard to close a laptop. Everybody feels like you have to be on all the time. Um, and again, like there's too many ways to, to get in contact. Like it's Slack, email, text, social media, all these things. And so um, I do have a lot of conversations with people about just being mindful of like how often, how late, all of those things. Cause I think that it can be really exhausting for people. Myself too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is another, another question from a viewer from Monica, uh, sorry, from uh, Janicia Britt. Uh, Janicia asks, what is bringing you joy right now? Oh, that's a good one. Um, honestly, I, I wouldn't consider myself a super optimistic person. I'm, I'm more of a cautiously optimistic person. Uh -huh. um, but I, I'm really hopeful for the future. And I think a lot of really important conversations that we've been forced to have. Um, I don't think I've ever had so many conversations about racism in the workplace and, and just race, you know, with coworkers, you know, since last year. I mean, I think that in itself was like, oh, I actually feel like things will shift and things will get better because we're finally having a lot of these hard conversations. Um, and that's brought me an odd sense of joy, even though it's obviously come from a really sad place, but it makes me really hopeful that we're at least having a lot of these conversations more often and that it's not something that feels hidden or siloed um, and the warm weather helps. So, yeah. uh, This is a question from Jada Hill. Jada asks, when did you know that it was time for you to leave Teen Vogue for another role for another company? Um, I knew probably, I, I knew that I had outgrown some things, um, but people love to talk about my age in every interview. There's like a weird fascination around this, which is totally fine. Um, but I think I obviously like knowing me um, and, and anyone who's close to me has always joked that I just act a lot older than I actually am. And, and my parents always felt like I was, you know, really old soul, even as a child. And so I was really wary of leaving because I felt like people would also kind of, people like to also weaponize how young I am when I make certain decisions or say certain things of like, well, you're young, you wouldn't understand, or well, you're young, you're jumping around from thing to thing. And so um, I felt like I had outgrown it at a certain point, but honestly, I felt very um, worried about kind of being labeled as someone who would just jump from thing to thing because of my age. So it, it took a while for me to then actually make a decision to leave. Um, there are some questions about, about Teen Vogue and, and, you know, you don't have to answer them, but I'm, I'm obviously there was, um, you know, there was a an unfortunate um, sort of series of of things that happened at Teen Vogue after your departure, the editor and editor was hired and the editor never took the position. There was um, opposition from the staff um, about the editor and some tweets that she had sent out. Um, I'm sure you followed the story and I'm sure it was painful for you to see that happen at a place where you worked for so long. Um, what, what, what do you make of what, what happened and, 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 and sort of the outcome? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't believe in cancel culture. I don't think it's productive. Um, I, I'm a person of faith, so I am really invested in forgiveness. I'm really invested in redemption and um, I'm not perfect and none of us are. And so I never want to, I, I think, promote any of those things, but I, I love that staff dearly. Um, in, and it was very hard to leave that job because I, I love that team so much. And um, we became really close like a family. So it was definitely hard to watch, but I'm, I'm super proud of them and I'm super excited for all they have. Um, coming up, um, one of the one of the team members, um, Danielle Quatang, she was the culture director that I brought on, and she just got promoted to executive editor. So I'm really I'm really excited for them, and it's a really great team. So I'm excited for the future. So now you are um, running this this really huge um, and 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 um, you know very very sort of internationally visible site. Um, what 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 are your plans for the cut? Oh, so many. Um, <laughs> I always have literally 24 tabs open on my computer. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's crazy because, you know, we're, I worked at Teen Vogue before and then came back as editor in chief and, and I worked at The Cut before and coming back as editor in chief. So a lot of it um, is informed by, you know, things that I wanted to do back then, but then how do we do that in a different way now? And um, I, I just was always really hungry to, I think, make sure that we were being as inclusive and intersectional as possible. Um, and it's funny now, but I probably really annoyed Stella uh, when I worked at the cut before because I would come into her office with these long deck PowerPoint presentations of, I wanna do this and I wanna shoot this person. And she would say yes. And she would let me you know, go fly and, and go pass some ideas. And I would have to do them from the ground up, which most people didn't want to do because it was a lot of work. But I, you know, came to her a couple years ago and I said, oh, you know, Issa Rae, SZA, Dua Lipa, all these people are going to be really big. Like we have to do something. And she's like, great, you can do the whole thing. And so I would, you know, reach out to their agent and find a location and produce the whole shoot and style them and write the interview. Um, and I just was really hungry to do a lot of those things. And so I think a lot of that has also informed of how I want to make sure that we're really leading culture and we're not just, you know, chasing after, I think, a lot of stories that other people are going after. Um, I'm, I'm super, super grateful. The staff is incredible. Everyone is really kind. Um, and um, I think we're going to have some fun. I'm excited. You mentioned boundaries. Um, a few minutes ago about, you know, what, what will happen when you go back to the office. Um, what, what are some things that you have learned about uh, yourself, things that, that you have appreciated about this past year that you want to take with you as a leader in, in, in the next phase of whatever our world may, may bring us? Um, that's a good one. I mean, I, there's a there's a Toni Morrison stanza that I really love. Um, it's from The New Yorker, and it's a longer piece about work. And I used to actually have it up um, when I worked at The Cut in the office before. And I just always have it up on my computer because I think it's so important. And I mean, Toni's the god, so we, we bow down. But the first stanza, stanza says, whatever the work is, do it well, not for the boss, but for yourself. And I always think of that. Um, you make the job, it doesn't make you, your real life is with us, your family. And the last one, you are the work you do. Um, you are not the work you do. You are the person that you are. And those are things that I've been re reciting to myself and I keep it up on my computer and other places and I keep it on my phone, but I really, I think it's easy to get caught up in the titles and in the chase and in the goals and all of that. And I don't want to ever get lost in that. I love what I do. I love this work. I have just this innate desire to make great work that little Lindsay wanted to see. Um, but I'm doing it for me. I'm not doing it for all of these other things. And, and I think that's something that I'm consistently reminding myself of. Lindsay Peoples-Wagner, Editor-in-Chief of The Cut. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me again. It's fun. Um, and really quick before we go, a couple very, very quick um, announcements. We have, uh, we have a How About the Summit coming up. We're doing it this year. It's going to be 
all virtual, which means you do not have to leave your home. You don't have to come to San Francisco uh, like we did in years past. Um, we are going to have incredible conversations with amazing people like Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, Gary V, Brene Brown, Rashad Robinson, Adam Grant. Um, we're going to have amazing entrepreneurs who've been on the show in the past um, and and will also be on stage with us. Um, so check it out. Uh, we're going to have immersive, immersive networking sessions, uh, chances for you to, to connect with other entrepreneurs and people like who are who are building things like you. If you want to find out more about the summit and get a ticket, it's not that expensive. And it's I promise you it's going to be worth your time this year. It's three days or four days, actually. Uh, you can find out more at summit.npr.org. So please do check it out. Um, once again, Lindsay, thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody.